Exiled Alpha by Silverless Chapter 3 Whispers of Him The sun is starting to sink down, casting a dim light over the bare trees and white sparkling mountains. The air is cold, invigorating. I walk along a snow dusted path. I walked along a snow dusted path leading out of our little village and into the woods nearby. Large trees, somehow still full with leaves, form a circle around the clearing. Amy is standing against a shadowy tree line. A group of girls, none of which I've ever bothered to have a conversation with, are surrounding her. Their voices are low, kept in hushed tones that only single one thing. Gossip. I perk my ears, listening in. I hear he's ruthless. A monster whose wolf is three times the size of any other alpha. A petite beach blonde, Maya, whispers, her eyes wild for epithets. Her brunette friend shudders before giving her input. They say he's an absolute beast. He goes out, commits mass murder whenever he feels like it. Suddenly, she lowers her voice even more and it turns shaky. God, what if he comes here? Who knows where the hell he is right now? They all exchanged wide-eyed glances, looking to gouge each other's reactions. Who the hell are they even talking about? And why are they so jittery? As I approach, a stick snaps under my heel. All of them, including Amy, who has seemed fearless for as long as I've known her. Maya even lets out a choked scream. All of their eyes turned on me, as if I were the devil come to claim their souls. Their faces ghostly pale, and their mouths are agape. God dang it, you can't do that. Maya shrieks at me, her face turning into an accusatory stare. Something about her tongue cuts right through me. I narrow my eyes and push my lips into a snarky pucker. If you're so scared, and why don't you go choke on something besides fear? She sucks in a sharp breath, taken aback. Maybe it was a bit too far, but I can't say that I'm sorry. Nathan has already frayed my nerves for the day. Maya's mouth gapes like a fish out of water as she tries to find her words. You know what? F you. She spits before storming off. The other four girls follow her off, scowling at me as they go. I brushed it off and turned my attention back to my best friend. Amy remains standing with her back towards the trees. What was that all about? I asked, walking up to her and pointing a thumb back at the group. She isn't fazed by the little scene she just saw between me and Maya. At one point, she tried to teach me how to keep my her thoughts inside. Needless to say, she never did succeed. Now she doesn't even pay attention to my lack of a filter as she raises an eyebrow. Her forehead wrinkling. You haven't heard? I shake my head, furrowing my brow. I need to know what's going on. People gossip all the time. 
but never like this, not with such fear. They call him the Exiled Alpha. She pauses in order to look up at the sky as it grows increasingly darker. Shoot, I have to go. I'm already running late. Her sentences are rushed as she bends down to grab the strap of a purple backpack and heave it on her back. Wait, what do you mean exiled? Before I can finish, she reaches out and grabs me firmly by the shoulders. Looking at me dead in the eye with such intensity that I feel paralyzed. Listen to me, Adrienne. She squeezes my shoulders, speaking firmly. I don't have time to explain right now, but just don't go off into the woods by yourself. I know you like to, but don't. Stay near the pack. You understand? I catch a chill running up my spine. One that's not caused by the cold. I can only think one thing in that moment. And... It's what the F is out there. I don't understand. I have no idea what she's talking about. Only that whatever it is, is dangerous. But I nod anyway. This seems to be good enough for her because the next thing I know, she's pulling me into a hug. Stay safe, B. She says behind my ear. So much for her seriousness. When she does, she's wearing one of her signature ordinary grins. Unusually, that gesture would comfort me. Seeing her back to normal instead of spewing warnings at me. But it doesn't. Because her smile is half forced. Sorry that I can't stay for the party. Looks like you'll get Nathan all to yourself, she teases sarcastically. A pang of anger shocks my stomach, and I open my mouth with intent of spitting profanities at her. But I bit my tongue as realization hits me. She doesn't know. She doesn't know about the blackmailed engagement or wedding. If she did, she would have told me. I know she would have, and she would have kicked Nathan's butt, regardless of the consequences. I forced an empty smile back to her, not quite as convincing as her own. Let her have her fun, I think. My problems aren't hers. Yeah, whatever. I call back as she gets farther and farther away. Just don't get AIDS. She turns around just brief enough to stick her tongue out at me in a playful sneer. I let out a heavy sigh when I turned around and start walking back. There were a couple of people bustling about, a lot of them carrying various ribbons or decorations. I walk past all of the working walls, heading back to my room. If Nathan or Andre either one expect me to prepare for the party of my own demise, then they're out of their minds. What could they possibly do to me? Sentence me to a lifetime of misery? Oh, wait. It's been three days since Amy left. Three days that I've been locked in my room, trying anything to keep my mind off reality. The only time any part of me left the room is when I stuck my head out of the window to smoke, not wanting the smell to stick to the walls. The little glass ashtray on my desk is full, and two empty cigarette packs lay in the trash can. At least four times a day, one of my lower-ranking members, a maid or a servant, would bring me food. My only guess is that is Nathan's way of trying to suck up, feigning sweetness and hopes that I wouldn't act out during the ceremony.
What he doesn't know, though, is that his pathetic attempt to win me over is in vain. I wouldn't bend for that, but no matter how much food he sends to me, I haven't even realized I was letting myself drift to sleep until a knock on the door stirs me awake. Every time food was delivered, Someone called out to me after knocking. No voices follows this one. Now what is it? I, let me guess. I have to put in the bridal shower. They knock again, this time louder. I'm coming. I growl, untangling myself from the sheets. I stumble my way over to the door and open it. Nathan is standing there, hands in his pocket and a polite smile on his face. Well, hey there, sleepyhead, he chirps. His tone is so nice that I can almost feel the bile rising in my throat. The party's starting in half an hour, so look your best. It is in our honor, after all. I narrow my eyes and step back, looking him up and down. Who the heck are you? He laughs, as if that were the funniest thing he had, he'd ever heard. He laughs, as if that were the funniest thing he'd ever heard. A cheerful sound, but also a fake one. I just came to remind you. He says with an overly friendly tone before turning business-like. Now, do something with your hair. Put on something expensive and meet me downstairs in ten minutes. I don't move. Instead, I stand like a statue, keeping my skeptical stare focused on him. Okay, look, as my chosen Luna, you have to have a look that makes everyone jealous of you on sight. Of course, they'll already do that as long as you're on my arm. But still, I expect you to act like a perfect sweetheart. And if not, there will be consequences. And just like that, the act is up. He conceited and bossy attitude is back in full swing along with a pulsating vein at his neck. It always makes an appearance when he doesn't get his way. I continue staring at him with dead eyes, knowing it would eventually make that nerve of his crack if he intends to try and control my life, which he does. Then he'll at least have to give me his reasoning. Why am I your chosen Luna? I ask. Suspiciously, it doesn't make sense to me. We don't get along anymore. So why would he want to marry me? Against my will at that. He smirks, meeting my eyes with a devious gleam of his own. You're mouthy, Adrian Gage. A sharp tongue and a clever head. That's what people can't see until it's already too late. He moves over, lifting my chin with his thumb, with less than an inch between our cheeks. His hot breath fans over my ear as he speaks in a low whisper. And I can't forget those gray eyes. They're so cold. So unpredictable. And so unreadable. He swipes his thumb across my jaw as he steps away turning and leaving just like that. Remember, he calls, his voice echoing in the dark hallway. Ten minutes. My fingers raise to touch where he did. I rub the skin until it starts to burn. I'm quite certain that I rubbed it raw with my palm, yet it still doesn't feel clean. So that's his reason. He plans to use me as his pawn, but I'll be damned if I help him win whatever chess game he thinks he's playing. With Alpha Andre's threat in mind, 
I close the door and get to work on myself real less instantly. If only I had a fashion savvy best friend like all the movies portray, then this would be a lot easier. The cruel thing is that I do, except she's miles away, partying her butt off in another pack. At least one of us is having a good time.